Okay, so good morning. Um, today uh, we're going to be, well, not quite finishing up, but we'll kind of be bringing a, a lot of what we've talked about so far uh, together into a single comprehensive uh, Eulerian Lagrangian methodology for dealing with particle laden flows that essentially fall under all possible categories that we've discussed so far. So uh, dilute, dense, uh, one-way coupled, two-way coupled, four-way coupled, we should, we, should have, we should be accounting for pretty much everything today. Uh, we'll leave a few things behind. I'll hint a little bit at what evaporation or phase change could look like in this framework, but we won't really spend more time on it than what we've done already. Um, so essentially we'll take as principal assumptions an incompressible flow and even then it, we're not going to necessarily have to assume a constant density but just a, uh, a low enough Mach number that we can make use of um, or that, we, that we don't have to worry about uh, the equation of state. We will, um, well what else? We'll be taking our particles as spheres. Uh, we will be, well, that's pretty much it, I think. In terms of assumptions, we're not going to go too far. Uh, we're not going to have that many assumptions involved. Um, for the most part, you'll see some of the things we've talked about before, except that we'll try this time to have a more systematic and analytical approach to writing everything together. Okay. Um, I'm starting up here, so my, my vision for this is basically to tell you how at this point um, I'm doing particle laden flow simulations uh, and a number of other groups in the world are starting to also do particle laden flow simulations. We're going to be talking about this in the context of what uh, I referred to yesterday as mesoscopic or mesoscale simulations. Okay, so we're not going to be looking at a methodology that is readily applicable to large-scale industrial type problems. We're not going to be looking at the macro scale. We're not going to be looking at um, meters high uh, reactors. And the main reason for that is going to be cost. So this is not a uh, final perfect solution to the type of problems that we might be interested in, but it is a mathematically grounded way of dealing uh, properly with particle laden flows in the Eulerian uh, framework for the fluid and Lagrangian framework for the particles, wherein we deal with very dense region, uh, potentially even fully compacted particles, all the way to fully turbulent and agitated flows. Okay. I, so I'm giving you the main, the main reference for this. I'm not trying to toot my own horn here, but this is a... Uh, a JCP that I think should also be included in your course pack for this afternoon. Um, this is where most of these equations are laid out. The, um, uh, an interesting reference regarding what the state of the art uh, has been in the, in, the, in the fairly recent years until, say, the end of the last decade is right here, the annual review of fluid mechanics of Balachandar and John Eaton. Uh, Balachandar is uh, a, um, a very well-known uh, theory and CFD person working on particle in flows, and John Eaton has been probably one of the, um, of the most well-known experimentalists working on particle laden turbulence. Okay, so they came together, wrote a very nice paper saying this is where we stand at this point with our understanding of particle laden flows. Uh, the, or well, specifically turbulent particle laden flows. And there's, uh, there's a pretty sharp contrast between what they said, okay, here's what we know, here's what we can do, and what I think we really know and can do now, and part of that is because of some of the flexibilities of the, methods, uh, of the method we're gonna talk about today. This afternoon, we'll only take one additional piece from this. We're not gonna implement all of this. This would take a significant amount of effort, uh, for the most part, the main thing that would be, uh, that would require quite a bit of work would be putting in the effect of particle volume fraction. This would be akin to accounting for fully viable density uh, solution. Uh, 
And I argued already that this is not particularly difficult, there's no fundamental challenge there, but it would essentially multiply the number of, of, uh, of uh, source code lines by a better factor of two. And as such, it's not a negligible increase in complexity. So we're not going to worry about this. However, we'll add the collisions and we'll, we'll talk for, during the afternoon about what we can get with this and what we cannot get. All right, I'm giving you a few additional references that are not necessarily very, uh, necessarily highly relevant, but just as a contrast, you can look at what uh, other codes, either commercial codes like uh, ANSYS Fluent or semi-research code like Kiva, uh, are doing for their for their particles. Uh, it's always an interesting thing to look at and try to see uh, when you try to see where the state of the art uh, stands. Uh, and finally, I'm giving you a couple of additional references here. Probably the most interesting one I'll refer to in a, in a minute is right here. Um, but I'll, I'll refer to that in a second and I'll tell you why this is interesting. Okay, I will just start by connecting to what we left off with yesterday. So like yesterday we talked about Euler-Euler methods and with those Euler-Euler methods we essentially decided to start from essentially the Boltzmann equation. So we said it is reasonable for us to try to say something about the probability of finding at a position x at the time t a particle that has a certain volume vp and a certain velocity up. Okay, we took that approach and that's what, uh, and we wrote an equation for that, that boiled down to the uh, William Spray equation or the William Boltzmann equation. And then we took moments of that and we obtained our Euler Euler uh, model. We're going to take one step further, uh, one step backwards, just for a second, and then we'll, we'll get back on track. The step backwards here is to say, well, collisions, we argued, are problematic if you only have information about a single particle. So really, if you wanted to solve the full problem in the most brute force way, you would ask yourself, what is the probability of finding a particle at location x at time t with a volume vp and a velocity up, given the fact that I have a second particle at that other position at, at, at that other time with that other volume and that other velocity, and yet another particle at that location and that velocity, et cetera, et cetera. So basically, if you want to completely brute force your way through this problem, you would be solving for the full multi-particle density function instead of this one particle uh, probability density function that we talked about. So if you t treat your particle ensemble as uh, essentially a, a, an ensemble of random variables, then you can recast the problem as the f in the following way. You can give yourself NP particles, and then you can give yourself a large phase space in which you'll be looking at the evolution of your random variables. This will be all your particle positions, all your particle velocities, all your particle volumes. All of these parameters are random variables. So now you could define a joint PDF for all of these. Okay, this is really brute forcing this to the point of being completely useless, but you can define the function f of time, space, and all those variables, the random variables that describe your particle phase. This is the multi-particle density function that we talked about yesterday that we said that the Euler-Euler method gives up upon. It basically doesn't treat the multi-particle aspect, it treats the one-particle aspect. But the argument we made also is that if you want to be able to deal with collisions, you need to be able to say something about collision pairs and therefore you need multi-particle information. Well, that, that's, um, th this is a pretty straightforward uh, uh, concept to look, to look at now because if you have this function of all your possible random variables, you can easily uh, differentiate it and, uh, by, by essentially just writing what's called a Liouville equation that represents all the possible ways in which that function can change. Uh, that equation looks a lot like the equation we wrote yesterday. So basically every single variable listed here will have an influence in the evolution of this, uh, well I'm saying that, but I did not include changes for the volume. So sorry, I'm missing a term here. But every single possible uh, variable in this, uh, in this equation will influence, uh, a variable in this, uh, in this phase space will influence the evolution of that, uh, of that function. So this is the most general Euville equ equation uh, at the start of the problem. This is what we want to solve. This contains absolutely everything. This equation obviously is impossible for us to solve. 
right? And this is like yesterday we have, this is our um, uh, physical space transport. Uh, physical space, I don't know how to write anymore. This is your velocity, space transport. This is your collisions. All the physics is injected in there. So, because the number of variables that this function depends upon is so large, you cannot brute force your way through a solution of this. So here's what you typically do. You'll build an approximation to the solution of that equation. When you're looking at a big Liouville equation like this, this is where people usually call upon stochastic methods. What we typically refer to as Monte Carlo methods, basically will do uh, we'll do uh, repeated random sampling of, uh, of this equation in order to find a solution. <coughs> the issue with the issue with the Monte Carlo type of approach is that it is not particularly well suited for a situation wherein you would like to solve the, the, the fluid phase in a deterministic manner. So if you want to write your standard CFD equations for the fluid phase, you want to solve Navier-Stokes, you're basically telling yourself that you're choosing a deterministic approach, you'll have one realization, you'll have one flow field. How do you deal with that? With a bunch of different, uh, how do you uh, couple that to a bunch of different realizations of possible particles that might, uh, that might represent your, th that might uh, uh, correspond to your f uh, function here? It, it is conceptually difficult. You cannot easily put a particle, remove it, or else you have suddenly these continuous wakes that will appear and disappear. It is, it is a tricky concept to think about. So the deterministic approach is interesting, oh, sorry, the uh, stochastic approach is, is interesting um, in the sense that it should give you some good co statistical convergence, it should you know, be a, a functional approach, but it's, it's uh, complex to deploy in the context of those type of, uh, of, uh, of uh, two-phase flow problems. This reference here attempts to do this. It essentially sets the stage analytically, it tells you what it would look like to actually solve this properly in a fully stochastic sense. How do you have, essentially this addresses the proper way of going after particle laden flow simulations from a purely statistical perspective. So I'm not going to say it doesn't exist. I'm going to say I think I'm just not smart enough to understand how this works. So I'm going to stay, take a step back and I'm going to say what's the next simplest thing we can do? Well, if we take a deterministic approach and say, well, maybe we cannot solve for f, but maybe we can just look at what one realization of, a of an ensemble of particles might look like. Let's just build one realization and study this. That's something uh, that we can consider. It's easy to think about. Basically, we're saying now, let's consider the particles to be real, to be actual particles. They're actually distributed in an experiment. We're seeing how they move around. This is what we're computing now. Well, what this is, is really one realization of this f function. So statistically, it's not going to give a lot of information about this f function. But it's still going to tell us a lot about the physics. So we'll consider this approach here. We'll take our particles to be real particles, not notional Monte Carlo-like samples of our distribution function, we'll take them as being actual concrete objects. The other very interesting thing here is if we take this approach, well, if we're arguing that all the particles are part of the same realization, then they can actually truly collide with one another. Again, we're back to this idea that we don't need to model collisions, we know everything about collisions. All right, so this, is, this, is, this was my, my zoomed out starting point. Now we're going to zoom in and go after what we've just set ourselves to do. So we're going to build one realization of the particle flow field and have it, uh, in, of the particle field and have it interact properly with the fluid phase. Uh, 
we argued already that we know everything about the micro scale equations. So it's a situation that's pretty interesting. Uh, we're trying to derive a set of equations, but we really have already a closed set of equations. Okay, so we, we're not starting from scratch. We know in that situation that we have a particle that is located at some position xp, that is moving at some velocity up, that might be rotating at some uh, velocity omega p, that will be inducing a um, modification on the surrounding flow field that might look like that, that will also be generating boundary layers at its surface. All this we've talked about, we know, we know that essentially we have no slip, no penetration at the surface of the particle. Uh, the only thing we need to add is contact mechanics to have the interaction between the particles. So plus no slip and no penetration plus contact mechanics between particles. All right. So we can write all these equations. We did that already. I'm just going to summarize them. We have conservation of mass for the fluid phase. We have Navier-Stokes for the fluid phase, where I'm writing tau as being the sum of pressure plus the viscous stress tensor. I'm writing that in a very general way. I'm allowing in this the, uh, the, the density to vary. Okay, So this is, I'm assuming here, a low mark representation to not have to worry about an equation of state, but I am, I am still fully allowing variable density. And then we argued already that we know everything at this point about the particle physics. The only thing I've added here is this cold term, F cold term. So this we had already. This is mass times acceleration of the particle P. This I just rewrote. This is, I wrote that with an inter to signify that this is really an interaction force between the different phases. But this is what we've called drag so far. Uh, MP times G is gravity, and then we're going to have some sort of an interaction force between particles and calling collision. And then if you have a situation where you know everything about the flow field, then we mentioned that before already. This interaction force, this drag force, you can directly evaluate it by surface integrating the fluid stress at the surface of the particle. And so this is a closed system of equations. Uh, we've worked only with linear momentum. You can work with, mom uh, with angular momentum as well. Uh, I wrote angular momentum omega p. This is angular velocity, so sorry. You can do the same thing. Uh, it is not a new, uh, it is not a particularly exciting concept. Uh, you just take the cross product between the position vector and the uh, force applies, uh, applied at the point of the, uh, where the particle is present. If you go through this, you get the same way as we had for, second, for Newton's second law. You'll have a moment of inertia times the rate of change of the angular velocity of the particle. And then what you'll have is uh, the surface integral of the, uh, of the arm, essentially, uh, cross, uh, uh, with the cross product uh, with the force applied. So that's the force applied by the fluid stress at a point crossed with the normal vector from the particle surface times, essentially, the radius of the particle, diameter divided by 2. And then same thing for the collision. You'll take the arm length turn it into a vector cross product with the collision uh, force between the particle uh, between the particle j and the particle p, uh, p. Okay, so we're just saying if you want the rotation, you just have to look at the torque induced by the forces applied at the surface of the particle. So again, all this is closed uh, under the assumption that someone doing contact mechanics tells me how to write a collision. Okay, but this is not fluids anymore, so uh, I'll, I'll assume that uh, we can get that from somewhere else. 
So this is the torque from the flow, and this is the torque from collisions. Okay, so fine, what we've described so far is a set of pointwise equations that require, if you want to perform CFD of this problem, Well, if you have a single particle, you would want a spherical mesh. And then it's pretty, uh, pretty cheap. You can do this. You can mesh, you can have nice body fitted mesh around the individual particle. As soon as you have more than one particle, this is not going not to cut it. Uh, over the years, people have used uh, other set methods. So they've combined Cartesian meshes with uh, spherical shells, uh, spherical shells tied to the presence of the particles and then interacting with an underlying Cartesian mesh. That's the way you can do this. So you can use an overset meshing strategy for two or more particles. By that I mean a spherical shell mesh around the particle. Overlaid on the Cartesian mesh. But by far, I think at this point, the method that has dominated the, um, the CFD research in this uh, area has been what's called Emos boundaries. Emos boundaries is the idea that you simply forego uh, having a body fitted mesh and you allow your mesh to penetrate inside the object and you will model instead of, uh, instead of exactly uh, enforcing your boundary conditions, you will, you will model, model your no slip and no penetration boundary conditions. So that's what you find probably the most often at this point. Mm -hmm. So this is what we call a non-body fitted mesh, a non-boundary fitted mesh. So simple Cartesian mesh that penetrates inside your, your object. We're not going to talk about this. I'll just do a quick, um, quick little back of the envelope calculation. Assume that you have a reasonably accurate humus boundary scheme that allows you to put, say, even only 10 points, 10 cells, across the diameter of one particle, okay? It's not a lot. Most immense boundary schemes would already struggle giving you reasonable, accurate, uh, reasonable accuracy for, say, drag with 10 particles across the uh, with, sorry, 10 cells across the diameter. But imagine 10 cells across the diameter gives you reasonable results. Then that means that essentially a particle requires already a single particle, right? So a solid object in which there's no flow that requires already 10 by 10 by 10 cell, a thousand cells. That means we're not resolving all the scales in the field, not these methods. We need not go to the minor, uh, the, the smaller scales, and we are resolving grid, and we are telling that uh, grid space will be smaller than the particle diameter. We are not resolving all the scales in the fluid surface. Why? Why, why would I be saying that? Uh, how could... Uh, uh, we, are, we, cannot, we can we apply DNS in this 
Well, in, in what kind of conditions? I'm just saying here um, that you might be in a situation where, so I'm just, we're doing a, a, a thought experiment where we assume that we have reasonable results, good results uh, for capturing the flow around the particle with 10 cells across the diameter. Uh, that's all I'm saying. We're not, uh, we're not talking about point particles here. Everything is, so this is, um, right, this is, this is, this is the, uh, the way I wrote the course so far. So we'll jump to point particles uh, in, in uh, like 30 seconds, okay? So for now, we're still in the realm of fully resolving uh, everything. And I'm trying to make the case why we need to do something um, that is, uh, that is uh, one step beyond. So imagine, so assume the IB, as in the most boundary, is accurate with 10 cells per dp. That implies that one particle is essentially already a thousand cells. Now, that already means that if I want to deal with a simple 10 particles by 10 particles by 10 particles array, uh, close back, in a, just lined up in a, in a face-centered um, arrangement, right? it's a very simple uh, square lattice, cubic lattice, then I already have a million cells to deal with just this little clump of particles. Now, so what that means is, yes, we could probably simulate that. We can probably simulate, you know, say you can afford to run uh, with, say, 10 million grid points or maybe 100 million grid points. Then you can start looking at a decent number of particles interacting with one another. But keep in mind here, we're at really high volume fractions. What if we're interested in looking at, say, a volume fraction of 10 to minus 2, 10 to minus 3? two orders of magnitude below that. Let's just say 10 to minus three. Then remember in our, in our simple lattice arrangement, the interparticle spacing now will be about 10 times the particle diameter. Okay, so now we're looking, so we wrote that as L over D, well, I guess I should write this uh, little dp as approximately 10, which means that now we're looking at a, uh, a thousand cells times 10 times 10 times 10 for a single particle. So now we're back to looking at a million cells for one particle. So the point I'm trying to make here is that if you want to look at dynamics of many particles from a fully resolved standpoint, where you resolve the flow in a pointwise sense of the surface of the particle, um, well, you're going to be able to do that in a number of situations. If you have very dense particle laden flows, you might be able to do that for very small domains. Uh, if you have if you're far from, from, being, uh, uh, from having a packed ensemble of particles, the cost is going to be enormous to the point where if you're looking at moderately dense, uh, even somewhat dilute systems, most boundaries are not going to be within reach for you. So we need something else. And that something else is what, uh, at least one, ver oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. 
Like, true. So uh, I'll. So I'm naively uh, arguing here that Imos boundaries would be, or that the Imos boundary approach would rely on a uniform uh, mesh size. If you have better uh, uh, capabilities, in particular adaptive mesh refinement capabilities, then a lot of those arguments go away. There's other difficulties associated with uh, adaptive mesh refinement, in particular scalability. So how do you deal with doing adaption on many shapes on the fly as those shapes moves, uh, move around? Uh, it, it is at this point still difficult. But that's something that potentially could unlock a lot of very exciting studies. So a lot of people are working in those directions. Yeah. So that's a good point too. Uh, potentially being able to to uh, to refine around particles and de-refine away from particles uh, would solve a lot of those uh, limitations. So we're going to reintroduce a tool we talked about uh, a couple of days ago. I think on Tuesday. Or maybe yesterday, I don't remember. Uh, we're going to rely again on a simple volume averaging type of approach in order to help us uh, handle this, uh, th this, uh, this issue. So what we're going to do is going to be connected to two ideas, with, uh, one that I imagine you know already and one that, uh, that we've talked about already. So this idea of scooping out a little chunk of fluid and assessing what the characteristics of that chunk of fluid is, that's something we're going we're gonna to do uh, pretty much uh, on the fly uh, for our simulations. The other thing we're going to think about is essentially the concept of larger dissimulation. If you've done turbulence modeling and if, you look, if you've looked at larger dissimulation, you know that larger dissimulation is an approach wherein we reduce the cost of simulating turbulent flows by essentially filtering out the smaller scales in the flow so that they do not have to be resolved on a computer mesh anymore. And however, what you'll have to do is reintroduce models that account for those scales that you've removed, that you've explicitly filtered out. So we're going to do the same thing. We're going to say it is too expensive for us to resolve the flow of the surface of the particle. So we're going to actively apply a filter on the flow and filter out those scales that exist that have been induced by the presence of the particle. Okay? We're going to filter this out, and then we're going to go back and reintroduce what, we, what, what uh, physics are missing from this uh, filtering operation. So where do we want to filter? At what scale do we want to filter? Is the first question we should ask ourselves. So if you look at length scale and, uh, and log scale, we introduced already the concept of a microscopic or micro scale representation, wherein we look at the surface of the particle, a meso scale, and the macro scale. I'm going to throw essentially made up orders of magnitude type of, um, of values here. So I'll start with dp over 10. This is smaller than the particle scale. This is the boundary layer at the surface of the particle. This is the micro scale physics that essentially give rise to the concept of drag. If I keep going by factors of uh, 100, the macro scale will be maybe the 1,000 particle diameters and above. This is where we start seeing essentially reactor pipe scale uh, phenomena. So for example, you're looking at the gasifier, or riser, or downer. Um, this is where you're going to start seeing dynamics arise on the scale of, uh, of, of the, your, your multi-phase pipes uh, dimension. So, for example, say you're looking at a dense fluid ice bed reactor. So, a nice little bubbling bed like this of particles. Uh, 
uh, that might correspond to the characteristic length scale of the global bubbling dynamics in the system. Between what do we have? Well, we have at 10 dp, we have essentially the smaller scales at which it makes some sense to measure in homogeneity in the particle distribution. This is where we're going to see whether particles are a bit closer together or a bit further together, uh, or further from one another. So typically, the type of thing we're going to see on the scale of about deep, uh, 10 dp is the difference between this, yeah, or the, the non-uniformity that might arise due to clustering. Well, what we're going to go after as a filtering length scale is going to be essentially pragmatic, and I'll recognize that it's not going to be necessarily uh, because of its pragmatism, it's going to make our life easier, but it's not going to allow us to directly look at uh, uh, full engineering type problems. So we're going to say that this process is something that, you know, from the, the second lecture, uh, I think we made strongly the case that we understand this process well, and we know how to model it well. So if you wanted to, if you asked me provide a model for this, I would say, yeah, sure, no problem, I know how to do this. If you ask me to provide a model for describing the non-uniformity in the particle distribution that arises in various types of flows, I would tell you, well, uh, that's difficult. I don't know where to look. In some cases, maybe, right? The Maxi uh, theory that we talked about gives you some way of modeling the uh, depletion and accumulation of particles. But there's many other instances where we, we don't know really what to say. So it would be nice if we could explicitly resolve this but it's completely okay if we have to explicitly model this. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to place in between those things, so at the smallest possible meso scale, uh, scale, we're going to try to place a filter that will differentiate between the scales that we'll resolve in our equations versus the scales that we don't resolve and that therefore we're going to need to model. And that's going to be defining our filters, uh, filter scale that we're going to call delta F, filter width. Okay, so we're going to explicitly filter everything that is happening on the scale of a single particle. We're going to go after explicitly capturing everything that happens on a scale larger than that. So, let's be very, very concrete. We're actually going to give ourselves a filter and we're going to make uh, explicit use of this filter. So it's going to be a volume filter. Uh, we're going to write it as G of the distance from the point of application. So it's going to be a 1D filter in the sense that it's going to be uh, only the distance from the point of application are gonna, is going to matter. This filter kernel will be the you know, classical uh, filter that will decrease monotonically and it will integrate to one. Okay? An example for a filter like that, or a filter with those characteristics, would be a simple Gaussian filter. That's a pretty ugly Gaussian, but you see what I'm trying to suggest here, hopefully. And the characteristic length scale of this thing, say the width, the width at half height will be our characteristic filtering scale, which will be delta F. So now we're going to apply this filter explicitly onto our pointwise equations, onto our equations that are defined everywhere that fully define our problem and we're going to replace all of our pointwise variables with filtered variables. The consequence of that is that we should not have now to resolve our flow on a scale smaller than the particle anymore. So our goal, replace 
point-wise variables by smooth or smoother fields. to reduce mesh resolution requirements. Fine, so uh, what we're doing here is not tied to the type of, uh, of filter, really. It's going to be practical if our filter is differentiable, with what we're going to derive here. Um, but we could use other approaches. So I, there's nothing here that's really, uh, you know, in, the, in the field of uh, logic dissimulation, the, the influence of using different types of filters has been has been discussed extensively, and there's people doing different sh different things. Uh, we're not particularly tied to any type of filter, although we will differentiate it. Okay. The uh, other questions. So the earliest reference for this idea, it's not a particularly groundbreaking idea, right? We're saying we're we're smoothing our our, we're applying a smoother on our equations in order to not have to deal with the high resolution requirements. Um, the, the first fairly detailed analysis of this idea for particle laden flows is actually pretty old and it comes from a big name in chemical engineering, and that's uh, the name of uh, Roy Jackson. So, Anderson and Jackson. Back in 1970, uh, 1967, first uh, derived a set of equations that were filtered. They did, they did that with a number of assumptions. And more importantly, they did that from a theoretical standpoint. They arrived with a set of equations, and they said, well, it would be nice to look at what type of, type of models would need to be used. It would be nice to see if this works. but. As far as I know, it's not been, the, this type of approach has not been used directly. OK, uh, what else do I need? So, so concretely, you know, think about it like this. Say I have a particle. Now we're saying that we're also going to have, if I want to know something about the particle, about the particle and, and inform of my uh, uh, fluid about it, it's going to happen through the action of a filter that would spread out the information around. The uh, characteristic width of my filter, if we want indeed to be true to what we sketched here, would have to be much larger than the particle diameter to remove all possible local surface uh, information about the boundary layers developing. In addition to this, so the question is, might be, well, what do you do as far as defining delta F? How large should it be? I'll tell you right away that the pragmatic approach that we've used is to make it larger than delta P by an order of magnitude, but then as small as possible so that we can capture as much of the flow field, as much as the, 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 the physics on our mesh. Okay, So we've typically, uh, I don't have, I haven't done much beyond just looking at the delta f on the order of three, five, seven, ten times the particle diameter. So an engineering order magnitude larger, but not much more so. Okay, once we've done this, we can start defining concretely what, uh, what our variables mean. I'm realizing that I have uh, different notation compared to uh, I'm sorry. Um, so instead of alpha for our volume fraction, we'll be using epsilon, sorry. So the first quantity of, in, of importance will, is going to be our volume fraction. So this is going to be the fraction of particle uh, volume. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, 
physics which captures clustering like Cauchy forces and Van der Waals forces are not yet we are not putting it anywhere else. If the clustering is due to Van der Waals, I agree. If clustering is due to, say, uh, humidity, liquid bridges, I agree. If it's due to electrostatics, I agree. We haven't talked about any of that. If it's due to the uh, inertial dynamics of the flow, I disagree. Okay? So, certainly, uh, also if it's due to inelastic collisions, I disagree because we have, you know, we will model that. If it is due to the action of turbulence, I disagree. We will be solving for the flow field, we will be capturing the ejection from vortices. So uh, certainly if the physics leading to the clustering or the non-uniformity is coming from physical processes that we haven't modeled, we shouldn't expect for them to, uh, to be included in this, okay? All right, so, um, Particle volume fraction, ratio of particle volume to uh, local volume. We talked about that pretty naively as a concept of scooping out a region of flow and looking at the volume occupied by particles. Well, now a scoop is going to be a smooth scoop and that's going to be a filter. Okay? So we're going to be scooping out according to what a filter looks like. So essentially what we'll do is we'll be integrating over all the fluid what our filter is at a given location to tell us what is the amount of fluid that is present in the filtered sense locally. So this is a fluid volume fraction. Okay, I'm integrating my filter at a given point. This is a convolution product, right? We're, we're filtering. So I'm convolving my position everywhere in space with my filter centered in my, in my position of interest. If, since my filter integrates to one, if I had no particles, integrating over all the fluid region would give me a value of one. I would obtain a unity uh, fluid volume fraction. However, if I have a particle occupying part of space, then that will remove some of the contribution of my filter from my, from my, from my, from my from my integration, and therefore I will predict a lower volume fraction. So, a simple convolution. Between G and one. So I'm filtering one integrating over the fluid uh, region, and that gives me my volume fraction. Uh, it might make more sense to think about it from the other perspective, which is what is the particle volume fraction? Well, the particle volume fraction Essentially, we know exactly where the, the particle volume is. It is tied to the position of the particle, and it's you know, a certain amount of volume here that's tied to that particle. If I apply a filter to this, I'm essentially taking that volume and I'm spreading it out over a region of influence. Well, that's going to be my particle volume fraction. So if I look at the converse, the solid volume fraction, I'm going to write the same thing, or I guess the exact opposite uh, situation. I'm going to be integrating over the particle volume this convolution product between my kernel and essentially one. So if I have a particle here, I'm going to be spreading its volume to region of influence defined by my filter delta F. And by the way, if I have a second particle next to it, this is fine. I'm going to be spreading that information as well 
and those regions of inference was, will overlap, and I will have some uh, inference from both particles when I inform the calculation of the particle volume fraction right here. So this is also fine and good. Uh, we're just filtering quantities. We're going to need to make approximations to make this computationally feasible. And so the main approximation we're going to make now is to say that since our filter size is very large compared to the particle diameter, we can take shortcuts. So here, I'm going to say since delta F is much larger than dp, then it is reasonable for us to assume that our filter value itself, our filter kernel, will take approximately a constant value over the entire particle size. So we'll say that g is approximately constant over the entire volume of the particle. Right? My, my filter is much larger than the particle. And in that situation, if my filter is approximately constant over the volume of one particle, I can take this filter kernel out. I end up with the integral over the volume of the particle, which gives me just the volume of the particle. And now I'm going away from an integration and I'm just replacing this by a summation of all particles. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to be able to re-express my epsilon p, my particle volume fraction, which, by the way, will then also uh, will obviously be just 1 minus epsilon f. I'm going to write that as the sum over all the particles in my domain of the value taken by the filter at the position of the particle. Position x sub i times the volume of that particle. OK, I'm sitting at position. Uh, I should let me make one thing more explicit here, or else it can be a bit confusing. Here I'm evaluating epsilon p, uh, sorry. If I'm evaluating, evaluating epsilon p at position x, I'm sitting at x, I look at the value that my filter centered at x takes at, position, at the position of the particle, or vice versa, the value that the filter centered at the position of the particle takes at my location. I multiply that by the particle volume, I sum it up of all particles, and I'm done with my calculation. Provided the filter is large compared to the particle, this is going to be an, uh, a good approximation. OK, so now we know what our volume fraction is in this framework. Well, now we can essentially unroll everything. And that's going to be potentially a bit tedious. So I'll, I'll try to take a few shortcuts here and there. But well, maybe before we can uh, move on, maybe there are questions. If not, OK, if not, we'll, we'll just continue. So now. We have this filtering operation, and we have an idea that we're going to be able to make it more uh, efficient than actual, actually doing integrations. Um, so we're going to talk a bit about the properties of this filtering operation. First of all, we're going to recognize that every time we filter a variable A, and I'm going to designate that by the application of this overbar, we'll have a subfilter fluctuation that will uh, remain. OK, so I will have any field A that I'll be able to decompose into the filtered field A bar, and I'll be left with a residual. Now, I can think about what it means to obtain a filtered field A bar. Well, every time I do the convolution product between the pointwise field A and my kernel, if this pointwise field A is uh, quantity tied to the fluid, I will integrate only over the fluid because A might not, will not exist for the particle. So if I have a fluid quantity, I will filter it by convoluting it with the, uh, my filter and then integrating over the uh, fluid volume. What comes out of this operation is the product between the fluid volume fraction and the filtered A. So basically we're saying that 
any quantity that we want to filter will end up with a uh, weighting, essentially. The quantity will be weighted by the, um, by the volume fraction of, of the phase of that quantity. Uh, obviously, this is compatible also with uh, what we were talking about before. If A is equal to 1, then it gets us back to AF is equal to this. So this is a phase volume weighted filtering operation. Okay, we're going to be interested in looking at what it means to filter a derivative, either a time derivative or a spatial gradient or a spatial divergence. I'm essentially just going to give you the, uh, the, the, the outcome of the calculations here. Um, those are not particularly complicated calculations, but basically there's challenges that will show up. If we have a derivative that will filter, we don't expect to have direct commutation. And so if we carry out the calculation, this is what we find. If I want to filter, meaning con conduct the convolution product between, uh, or c conduct the convolution product with G, a fluid variable that is a gradient, then I'll get the gradient of my fluid volume fraction times the filtered quantity and then I'll have leftover terms. Okay, those leftover terms will systematically be surface terms. They will be terms that exist along the surface of the particles. Uh, basically along the, 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 the interfaces between the phases. So the important idea here is that the surface contributions just from um, just from Leibniz theorem. There's no, we're not, there's no physics here, it's only math. So this surface contribution, the reason is that there's no commutation. So this is working with a gradient. Uh, this is the derivation for divergence. And this is the uh, derivation for time derivative. Which are the three components, the three types of tool, the three types of terms we'll see in uh, Navier-Stokes and, uh, and uh, continuity. And again, uh, how do you do this? Using Leibniz. Theorem. <coughs> so in here, what shows up um, again and again is the sum over the particles of S sub i. What is this? Well, this is just our phase interface. This is the surface that separates the two uh, phases in our system. This S sub i is the surface of particle i, and then I'm summing over all particles. So this is the list of pretty much all the surfaces that, uh, uh, this is the union of all the, the, the uh, phase interfaces distributed in my problem. So S sub i is, the surface, 
of particle I. And which I realizing now I should really have called N sub I as well is the uh, particle normal vector. There's one additional thing I think I didn't define here, which is this u sub i. This uh, boils down to being the uh, velocity of particle i. It shows up because as we uh, perform the time integration, we end up getting a differentiation of the position of the surface of the particle, and that ends up averaging to the net translational velocity of particle i. So, we get those fairly complex equations, but they're pretty good news. It means that as we filter our equations, we'll see that there's additional things that will come up from the surfaces. If we didn't see that, we would have to worry about what's happening to drag and evaporation and all those physics that are happening at the particle scale. We're saying that, yes, we get terms you know, we get our expected terms acting on the filtered variables, but we also have remnant terms that will contain the, 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 point, the, the local physics at the surfaces. Um, any questions? Okay, so I had a quick note here, that I'll make, uh, but I, I'll make it very briefly. Uh, so far we've talked about the volume weighted or phase volume weighted um, filtering operation. If you truly look at the viable problem, at the viable density problem, you have to go one step beyond. For uh, those of you who've looked at uh, reactive flows, this is, or, or potentially those of you who've looked at uh, compressible flows, it will be nothing new. If your density varies, those type of filtering operation would require the density to be brought into the picture. So you would want to do then a volume weighted, but also density weighted averaging operation or filtering operation. This is what we refer to in the area of combustion as a Favre averaging or Favre filtering. Just a side note, so here so a basic filter A basic two-phase flow filter we've defined as being phase volume weighted. A viable density two-phase flow filter would really have to be phase mass weighted. And I talked about this choice of uh, delta F already, so we want delta F much larger than dP but as small as possible to maximize resolution. Maximize the resolution of the physics. Okay, we have our tool. We're gonna to apply this tool to our equations. Um, well, just do continuity, say uh, it's already tedious enough, then you'll see that things become quite a bit more complicated. Um, so we'll just apply this explicit fil uh, filtering. 
onto our continuity equation and build a, a filtered continuity equation for the uh, fluid phase, okay? So, this is where we stand. This is our point-wise continuity equation. Now I want to apply the integral over the fluid volume of that beast. Convoluted with G. equal to zero. Okay, I'm just applying explicitly my filter on the left hand side. What comes out of this? Well, there's really two terms. Term one is the filtering of the time derivative of the density. Well, we just give, gave ourselves the rules for doing that on the previous page. So this is going to give us the time derivative of epsilon f times my filtered density. We just gave ourselves this, uh, this uh, result. Uh, there's an additional term. We said there would be a surface term. Yes, there is a surface term. Plus the sum over all particles of the integral over the surface of all particles. So NP is my number of particles here. of the particle normal dotted with the particle velocity times the density of the fluid at the surface of the particle convoluted with my filter integrated all over the surface of the particle. This is going to be my surface contribution. I can do the same thing with my divergence term. This is the filter of the divergence of rho f u f convoluted with my filter dy. Again, we have rules for this. It's going to be the divergence of epsilon f times rho f u f, the entire thing filtered. We are using, sorry? We are uh, filtering out the small scales, like the particles, scales. So, will we be modeling this surface? Yeah, so uh, th this is where, so we've explicitly given up a microscopic resolution, right? So every single surface term is going to be a struggle for us. This is where, you know, if we knew how to express, express, uh, express those surface terms readily, then the problem would be, it would be closed at all scales. But obviously, it's not the case. We need to have lost something. Uh, in particular, we've lost the capability of saying anything about the fluid density at the particle surface, if it varies. So I agree with you. This is where we would need to inject some sort of a model. Uh, so in a typical situation, you would say, well, if I have no reason to think that the particle is, in is inducing some sort of a local change in density, you could approximate that with uh, far field density. Alternatively, if you have chemical reaction, if you have evaporation, then you can say something pretty concrete about what is the local uh, flow characteristic at the surface of the particle. So modeling is possible, provided you know something about the, mi the micro scale. But certainly, our simulations won't tell us this because we've acti actively filtered it out. Yeah. OK, so let me. Recombine all this, so we'll have also a surface term here, I and P of the integral over SP of N dot UF rho F at the surface of the particle convoluted with G dy. Okay, 
So one thing you can see already is that those two terms look a lot like plus and minus of the same thing. The only difference is that this guy invokes the particle velocity, while this one requires the fluid velocity at the surface. Well, there's one piece of good news here, which is that is, if the surface, uh, uh, if, the, if, if, this, um, if this is an inactive particle, then by definition, the no penetration, no slip condition requires that UF and UI are strictly speaking the same, and therefore, boom, boom, these two things go away. And it turns out that, in fact, the unclosed term for the time derivative is, the same, is minus the unclosed term for the, uh, for the divergence, and we don't need to worry about anything. So in that specific case, we wouldn't have to worry. However, if you have evaporation, now you're in trouble. Because if you have evaporation, well, the fluid velocity at the surface is not going to be identical to the particle velocity. In fact, you could argue that it would make sense to decompose the fluid velocity into its, trans in its pure translational component, the translation would be happening at the velocity u sub i, and then you could add to that a blowing velocity, a Stefan velocity at the surface. So that's a reasonable thing to do. Essentially, you would look at what is the average of uf that needs to be necessarily u sub i, the particle velocity, and everything that remains is coming from chemistry or, or uh, devolatilization of some sort of some sort of blowing mechanism at the surface. So if we want to delay our simplifications just a bit for the sake of, um, of uh, sustaining evaporation for a second, uh, this would be minus the sum i is equal to 1 to np of the integral over s sub i of n dot. And now I'm going to open up a bracket and I'm going to contain, I'm going to include two terms. And I'm going to decompose uf into its average, which has necessarily to be u sub i times rho f, plus everything that remains, the difference, which I'll place into a blowing term, or some sort of blowing velocity at the surface, some sort of a Stefan flow velocity, uh, rho f. Mm. Times g times dy. Now, now that I've done that, I can now safely say, well, this guy goes away. It gets cancelled out with that guy. Well, specifically this one here. And I'm left with whatever relative velocity exists at the surface. Uh, and here, maybe I can sketch that to make it more clear. If I'm looking at the particle translating at velocity u sub i, then I'm basically saying that the velocity at the surface of the particle, u sub f, right here, has to be equal to u sub i in most instances. And if not, really, it can be just uh, some sort of an additional blowing velocity at the surface. Which, in fact, I could write, uh, let me do that now, I could write this as a u blowing just magnitude times n. We'll take this one step further. What is this idea of integrating over all those surfaces, those, this quantity? Well, we can again invoke the fact that we have a filter size that's significantly larger than the particle. So if I write this as, let me rewrite this one step further here, as the sum from i is equal to 1 to np, the integral of f sub i n dot. And now I'll invoke this expression here, this u blowing times n. What this will give me is an n dot n times my blowing velocity, times rho f, times g, times dy. 
Well, n.n is not particularly complicated. Uh, in addition to that, my g, we've argued already that because the filter is much larger than the, than the, the particle length scale, it is approximately constant as I deal with it over a particle volume. And so the same is true over a particle surface. Right? This, this filter is much larger. Whether I evaluate it here or here or here or here or here or here, it will not change significantly. So I'm going to make that argument and take this g outside of this integral. I cannot take it out of the sum, but I can take it out of the integral. So I'm going to be left with the average blowing velocity at the particle surface, which is really the only thing we can hope to include in some sort of a Lagrangian model. So this, I should put little equal signs, but this now will boil down to a sum of all the particles. I'm not going to be integrating anymore because I've taken this g out, so I'm simply going to be evaluating. I'm going to be evaluating my filter at the location of my particle, and I'd be left with the average blowing velocity at the surface. So I'll, I guess I'll still leave that as an integral, but that's going to be the average blowing velocity times fluid density. Well, this is precisely what an evaporation model would give you. This is precisely a surface integral of a rho times u. This is precisely an m dot for a particle. This is an evaporation rate for a particle, or a condensation rate for a particle. That's an m dot evaporation, if you will. OK, so this is exactly what a model, where a model would, would get plugged in. Everything else is direct evaluation uh, at this point. Uh, since we kept this viable density, this is the occasion of invoking the Favre filter I've mentioned before. So this looks like this is a problem, right? If you want to solve for rho f and uf uh, 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 filtered but separately, that looks like this is a problem. Well, we're not going to deal with this problem explicitly. We're going to replace this by a simple change of notation. I'm going to say that if my velocity is Favre filtered, so mass weighted uh, and not volume weighted, then I can write this as the product I realize I forgot a little bar here. Um, I can write this as the product of my fluid volume fraction times my volume weighted fluid density times my mass weighted uh, fluid velocity. And so I formulate my equations for, in order to know the volume fraction, the volume weighted densities, and the mass weighted velocities. And now everything at this point, this equation is all nice and uh, self-contained. And we can summarize it as follows. D epsilon f rho f bar d t plus divergence of epsilon f rho f bar u f tilde is equal to well, typically zero, but again, we've included evaporation, so let's stick to it. Some sort of a source term uh, for density that here we're writing as the sum over all particles of the filter evaluated at the position of that particle times the m dot of that particle i. OK, so you can see here that we've pretty successfully handled continuity. Well, it's, you know, it's a linear equation. It's, it shouldn't be, uh, we shouldn't feel too, too proud. But you can see that now we have a direct effect of the particles. If we have more particles, they will occupy space. My epsilon f will be less. And as a result, my continuity equation is uh, going to feel that effect. So we've properly defied, uh, uh, derived the fact that the particle volume or I guess alternatively 1 minus the particle volume explicitly shows up in the fluid continuity equation 
if you want to derive things properly from scratch. So the next step is to do the same thing for the momentum equation. And this is where things get yeah, significantly more tedious. So we'll take a few shortcuts here or else we're never going to be able to get to the end. Um, we can summarize quickly the, um, the left-hand side because essentially the left-hand side of Navier-Stokes is not significantly different from the left-hand side of the continuity equation except for the little tricky aspect that it's nonlinear. So applying a filter on the, on the nonlinear term, for those of you who've looked at turbulent flows, you know that filtering or averaging or doing any type of operation on the nonlinear term will give rise to extra unclosed terms. So we'll have to face the same situation here. So we'll talk briefly about that, and then we'll talk about what's going to happen on the right hand side. Any questions before we? Uh... So, so the right yeah. The yeah. Uh, it, it is a constant for each particle in the sense it doesn't, now we've integrated, we've averaged, we've averaged it over the surface. So this is something that you would have to compute on the fly for each particle and it would be a function of time and a function of the conditions that the particle experiences. If, if you know the overall uh, evaporation mass throughout the process for all the particles, so we can sum it over them, it will also come as a constant. It's not varying with time as well. So basically, it is the equation from a single particle. So basically, the sum of all the particles. So this is for each particle at a given time. Yes. Okay. So if it w if you knew all this, then Well, you still need to provide that information in the, at the proper. So we're doing space and time resolved simulations here, right? We're, we're building the equations for fully space and time resolved uh, simulations. So, if you give me the integral of this over your entire process, you're not really helping me solve this local equation. If now you explicitly integrate that over your entire region of interest. Then that's fine. Then that's fine. Then you can say something about the uh, your control volume perspective of this, right? In which case it would be useful to provide information about your total evaporating evra evaporated mass, for example. Because we cannot we can calculate this from the energy balance as well, the total mass of water, water or anything that can that you created in the control volume. Uh, sure. So uh, this saying something about this would require a coupled knowledge with the energy equation for the particles. I, I would uh, I agree with this, yes. Other questions? Okay, so let's attack this little guy here. Um, well, uh, you'll allow me a shortcut, so I'll apply this big filter on the entire left-hand side all at once. This is the same story. We have a time derivative and then a divergence. This time derivative is going to give rise to the term you would expect. That means the time derivative applying on epsilon times the filtered quantity plus surface terms. The divergence will give rise to what you would expect plus surface terms. The surface terms, in the very same way as before, provided that there's no active surface, they will just drop out. Uh, if, if you have evaporation, there's still going to be a term that will remain. So we'll do all, essentially all of this uh, on the fly. Um, volume integrating this entire thing. And that will give me first d of epsilon f rho f uf, the entire thing bar. I'll do the same thing as before. We're not going to worry about dealing with the filter of the product. So look up so that you don't get confused. I'm going to erase this bar and I'm going to replace it by 
f the filtered volume fraction um, uh, density times the Favre filtered velocity. Okay. Times dt. And I'll go a bit crude here, and I'll just say, well, some terms due to surface contributions. There you go. Good science. Plus, same thing with the divergence. Divergence of epsilon f times well, this is where things are going to be a bit interesting. We can invoke the Favre filter again to make sure that our density stays out of the picture. So rho f bar. But then we still have a nonlinear product between two terms. So what we really have here is a uf, dyadic uf, the entire thing tilde. And there's no trick we can use here. We'll have to face this. This is going to be a modeling problem. Anytime you filter a nonlinear non equation, you'll face this. Plus, same thing as before, some terms, well, really minus some terms, minus the same terms, um, at the surface. And the same way as before, we're going to be able to decompose that between a translational uh, full particle moving around term and a surface blowing term. So if we want to be comprehensive, that's going to be translation plus blowing. And this will cancel with this. The same exact story has uh, happened for mass conservation. And we'll be left with the fact that when a droplet evaporates, it blows mass outwards. And in the process of doing so, it also blows momentum outwards. That's all we're saying here. Yes? So you are not adding your operation model here. It is automatically coming. Well, no, the, well, not, yes and no. The fact that evaporation leads to surface blowing is not a model. This is a statement that the velocity of the interface is discontinuous. It's handled at the level of the mathematical description. Now, what the rate of evaporation should be, that's something else. And that's something that math cannot really help you solve. And that's where you have to say something about the thermodynamics. And this is where you would need to you would need to, to say something about what that is, and this is where you would need an evaporation model. But you don't need to write all your equations and then afterwards say, well, I probably need to add this. No, your framework should be capable of saying, well, if there ever were some sort of surface blowing process, it would show up exactly here in that form. So we're just making sure that we don't kill terms and then reintroduce them in weird ways. We keep them all from the, from the very beginning. And then the question is, how do you represent this? Well, this, uh, you would go back to the uh, type of uh, Miller and Bellon uh, models, the uh, uh, langmuir knudsen type models we talked about briefly on the second day. So you would still need to invoke a model, right? This doesn't solve the modeling issue. But it certainly tells you what the model where the model goes. Um, OK, so we need to handle this. So this is not acceptable, because we want to solve an equation for uf tilde. But this is, again, I'm working with the assumption that you've all been exposed to turbulence and uh, uh, the Rance equations and uh, potentially LES as well. So you've all seen this idea that Essentially, I'm going to have to say that if I want to solve an equation for this, I'm going to have to rewrite that as essentially a uf tilde, dyadic uf tilde. And whatever remains, well, it's going to be a modeling challenge. And I'll give that, I rewrite that as a residual stress tensor, um, which will come from subfilter, uh, from the subfilter velocity residual. And that's something that I'm going to have to model. In the very same way that any type of LES model of a turbulent flow field requires modeling the same term. So this should not be a surprise that there's going to be some additional term here. So we'll take this guy and we'll right away explicitly say there's going to be a divergence of epsilon f rho f bar uf tilde dyadic uf tilde. This I can solve. This is fine. 
and there's going to be the rest. And the rest, I'm not even going to bother um, running it. Essentially, it's going to be the difference between what we want to compute and what we really should be computing. And I'm going to call that a residual tau, a residual stress. And that, clearly, that needs modeling. <coughs> it had to happen at some point. We couldn't hope to never have to pay the price of having filtered our equations. And then I should say that this guy will show up in the consistently, consistently with what we did before. We wrote an, a source term as S sub rho. Now it's going to be an S sub rho u, a momentum source term. So this is now a momentum source term due to the presence of a stiff end flow, due to the fact that evaporation also doesn't only inject mass in the fluid, it also injects momentum. And I guess we can even go one step further and write what it is. This guy will be the sum of all particles. What? Of the same term as before, except not working on mass, but working on momentum. So it's going to be a g sub x minus uh, g of x minus xi absolute value. So the value of the filter at the particle position times the evaporation rate of that particle. And what is the rate at which I'm injecting momentum? Well, what the velocity I'm blowing outward introduces in the uh, surrounding fluid, fluid moving at the velocity of the particle. So it is the velocity, translational velocity of the particle that uh, times the rate of mass creation that gives me the rate of momentum in general. And it's not magical if you just derive it. This is how, what it comes down to. So we can wrap up our left-hand side. Our filtered left-hand side looks like D rho, uh, sorry, D over DT of rho F. No, I wanted to start with epsilon F, sorry, of epsilon, epsilon F times rho F bar times UF tilde plus divergence of, again, sorry, of epsilon F times rho F bar times UF tilde dyadic uf tilde this we can compute just just fine plus a term that we need to model that's going to be a divergence of a tau residual again which is entirely showing up because this is not so this that we can compute is not what we need to compute but this is what we need to compute and so i'm plugging all this all the difference uh, into a residual term, and I'm going to say, well, I need to model that. So what is this? This is the effect of the subfilter velocity fluctuation on the transport of filtered velocities, very much in the same way as you would describe the uh, subfilter term in um, in the larger dissimulation. Okay. So because it's a nonlinear process, because uh, convection is a nonlinear process. The subfilter velocities are capable of moving super filter, you know, filtered velocity around, or filtered momentum around. So this is the effect of subfilter velocities on UF tilde and it needs a model. And then we have one last term. So plus S sub rho u, and this is, if you will, a, a term for evaporation, condensation, devolatilization, whatever you want to call this. Um, 
the right hand side requires some more work. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll skip a few terms. We'll skip the viscous term, for example. Well, we'll, sk we'll, skip um, we'll skip gravity, which is trivial, and we'll skip the viscous term, which is interesting um, and not closed either. There's going to be some salties there, but we'll skip it in the interest of time. We'll focus on one term, which will be the interphase exchange term. So what we'll do is go down here to the right hand side and I'll just make one thing explicit. So we'll ignore the, uh, again, the gravity. We'll just take a quick look at the viscous term and I'll make it, uh, I'll make it explicit where drag shows up in this, okay? And it's not that obvious uh, of a process. So if I filter my viscous term, I'm really filtering the divergence of my tau. Sorry, I forgot a G. I've been running it just G, dy. And now, this guy, uh, we can again apply the same rules. Uh, nothing different here, so it's going to be the divergence of an epsilon fluid times the filtered fluid stress tensor. And again, we've, yes. Uh, there's no tilde here because this is not pre-multiplied by density for this guy. Okay, so, and in fact, it's kind of a problem. It's a problem that shows up also in combustion of, uh, in combustion problems that really can, uh, the Favre filtering, the still the filtering, is ideally suited for the left-hand side of transport equations, but the right-hand side, the viscous terms and all that, they don't really call for Favre filtering, they call for normal filtering. So here, uh, you know, this is a pressure gradient and a uh, divergence of uh, viscosity times et cetera, et cetera. There's no explicit density showing up here, so this is a standard filter. Minus the sum from i is equal to 1 all the way up to np, and then we have all our surface terms the same way as before. So we'll have our n dotted with our tau at the surface, convoluted with g dy. Well, that's where the pretty exciting uh, stuff is coming in. This is where drag has to show up. Um, again, we cannot do all this for free. We have to pay the price for it at some point. Well, if we filter out the boundary layers, we have to have the wrong physics. There have to be additional terms. Well, this is the additional term here. The boundary layer, the existence of the boundary, layers, of the boundary layer at the particle surface is precisely contained in the local characteristics of the fluid stress at the particle surface, okay? So this entire thing is what contains the influence that the presence of the particle has on the fluid, okay? So this is how the fluid is aware of the fact that there is a particle. This term, I'll take it down just one step further and then we'll, we'll leave this behind and then we'll, we'll get the full equation. Um, so I'll just rewrite this by pointing out one thing essentially making a, an argument here of convenience. I will say that my surface uh, uh, stress, I can always write, in general, my stress, I can always write for any, and that's true of any field, I can write any field as the sum of the filtered field plus the residual. I'll do that here to highlight really what I know and what I don't know. So this is really the integral over the surface of my filtered fluid stress times g dy. But then I have the same term with everything that remains, which we've been writing as primes, 
Okay, so I took my surface stress, I split it into a filtered stress and the subfilter uh, stress residual. Well, if our stress has been filtered on a large enough scale, you could imagine that we've essentially taken out all local information about the, uh, about the, uh, the presence of the particle. We've uh, applied a filter that's removed the boundary layer. So essentially, this guy should not really contain any information regarding the particle anymore. However, this guy, this is where everything matters. This is precisely where the, uh, the, the, the fluid stress has been locally modified at the subfilter level, so at the micro scale level, due to the presence of the particle in the first place. Okay. So, if you think about, um, let me see, how did I structure this? So is the term, the, the second term, uh, does it depend on what? Um, so, uh, so the filter is large again, so we're going to be able to take it out. Okay. Um, so, so this will be able to get out there, but then we'll still have to deal with the local flow characteristics. So at some point we'll need to invoke a, mo a model because we've given up. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, this, exactly. This is, mo yeah, absolutely, yes. This is, uh, by definition, it's filtered quantities, so they're going to, in fact, this is how we're going to reintroduce, uh, th this is where, at this point, uh, buoyancy is, is hidden. So, Sorry. yes? The passive force, it's neither, like, it's not completely on the surface, right? It's yeah, so, so, how could a force from the fluid act on the particle other than uh, via the surface. So you can always think about what is the primary cause of a force acting on the particle, sure. But ultimately, the way the force is applied is through the, through the surface. So the, the, at this point, we've made no assumption at all. Everything is, well, that's not true. We've assumed the filter is large compared to the particle. But you know, the, the Bessé history term and, uh, you know, everything we've listed, all those things are in there. So specifically, uh, uh, for example, added mass, right? Added mass is a concept that acts through pressure. When you accelerate, you create a non-trivial pressure distribution around the object that creates an extra net, net force at the scale of the object. Well, that will show up in the form of a local distribution of P prime at the surface that arises from the acceleration. You'll have to say something about how to predict it, assuming that you only have knowledge about the filtered fields. But it, it is contained here. It is, we haven't lost anything. OK, so let's talk. Uh, so I'll leave that behind for a second, and we'll reconnect that. Well. I'll, I'll just give names here. I'll say that this is the resolved surface stresses, and those are the subfilter surface stresses. Okay, so we're going to think about the particle for a second. So if I go back, uh, well, let me scroll up a bit. But if I go back to my particle equation up, whoop, no, don't open it up. If I go back to my particle equation here, I called my interaction force as the integral over the surface of particle P of n dot tau uh, ds. Well, let's look at what this is in our framework. Uh, 
So f sub p enter is the integral over sp of n dot tau dy, okay? I'm going to do the same trick as before. I'm going to say that I can split that into two contributions. One is going to be, well, and also this is symmetric, so I'll flip that around. It's going to be my tau filtered plus my tau prime dot n dy. Okay, so I'm going to have my resolved stress and my fil filtered stress. So my filtered stress and my sub-filtered stress. Now, if I surface integrate uh, a quantity dotted with n over a surface, well, Gauss theorem tells me I might as well uh, volume integrate the divergence of the corresponding flux. So I'm going to do that for the first term. I'm going to integrate over the particle volume the divergence of my tau filtered dy. And then I'm still left with the surface integral of tau prime dot n dy. Well, under the assumption, and that's uh, maybe a somewhat more difficult assumption, that we filtered on a scale large enough our tau, I will assume that my gradient, of, my divergence of tau is approximately constant over the volume of the particle, and I'll let myself take it out of this integral. So I will rewrite this as the volume of the particle times the divergence of this uh, uh, tau filtered. Now, you'll notice here, uh, I think I'll make it a, a bit more obvious in a second, but this filtered stress sensor, uh, this uh, yeah, uh, filtered stress sensor, uh, it will contain, uh, first and foremost, the effect of the pressure. So the divergence of my stress sensor, of my filtered stress sensor will contain the gradient of my filtered pressure. So the force one of the f uh, components of the force that the particle feels is its volume times the, um, the gradient of the uh, filtered fluid pressure. Well, that's exactly buoyancy. Okay? So buoyancy, and why am I saying it's exactly buoyancy? Well, it's exactly buoyancy because buoyancy, for example, coming from a hydrostatic pressure distribution, this, sh this is a large scale process. A filter is not going to get rid of buoyancy. It exists on a much larger scale. So buoyancy here is already included here, for example. And now we're left with this uh, last term that we'll make a bit more explicit in a second. Um, this was the particle perspective. If we go back to the fluid perspective, let me define a big F, enter, that will represent the collective effect of all the particles on the fluid are sum over all the particles, the surface integral over the particle of n dot tau times g dy, which was a term we had when we were uh, expanding our um, our Navier-Stokes, uh, our uh, right inside of Navier-Stokes, and this we're going to be able to write as the sum. So plugging in what we just uh, what we just derived above is going to be the sum from one to n p of g times the volume of particle times the divergence of the filtered fluid stress at the position of the particle. Okay, so at position I, plus the same thing here, 
So here I'm just going through the process of taking the filters outside of the integrals, right? Because uh, the filter is uh, much larger scale. So my surface integral of my local tau prime dot n. So at this point, we're pretty much done. This is the force that the particle needs to feel. This is something we can explicitly calculate, and it will show up in the right-hand side of Navier-Stokes as well. This will show up in the right-hand side of Navier-Stokes, and that also needs to be given to the particles. This we will have to model. This is the effect of a subfilter term that will need to be modeled. So what the fluid feels ends up being the sum over all particles of the filter kernel applied on the particle position times the force felt by the individual particle I. So this is just a statement of momentum conservation. The force felt by the particle due to the fluid has to be minus the force um, felt by the fluid due to that particle. Just that we have one fluid and many particles, so there's a summation in between. OK, so let me, we took very few shortcuts here. Uh, so in the interest of time, I'll just write the final momentum equation. We essentially uh, did everything already, so I'll just collect all the terms that we've derived. And I highlight what needs to be modeled, what doesn't need to be modeled, and what type of model we would bring to bear on this. Then we'll say a few things about the Lagrangian side of thing, where we've said a lot already. Um, and then we'll, uh, well, we'll essentially wrap up, we'll finish up this afternoon with the, the final little elements, in particular the collision aspect. So, let me summarize the entire, or not summarize, but bring together all the terms. D epsilon f rho f bar uf tilde dt plus divergence of, so we did that already, epsilon f rho f uf tilde We have the filtered stress tensor. If we want to include gravity, it will look like an epsilon f rho f bar times g, the gravity field. Oh, I'm realizing now that I have two g's. So the g's with the uh, uh, underline is the gravity vector, okay? Plus an s rho u coming from evaporation, typically. Uh, the way we've put our signs together, we have a minus big F enter for the interface coupling force minus a divergence of a tau residual. So this is the full equation that we've derived. This is uh, the, the only uh, running approximation that we have throughout here is that the filter is large compared to the particle. So, the left hand side is clear. Temporal rate of change of filtered momentum, convection of filtered momentum by filtered momentum, uh, by filtered velocity. Well, I can write uh, temporal rate of change of filtered momentum. This is convection of filtered momentum by filtered velocity. Those two are closed. Then we have the effect of 
filtered stresses. Then we have gravity. Then we have evaporation. Then we have what really I should put in red because this is probably the most key term in this entire exercise, the interface or the interphase momentum exchange. The last term is the convection of filtered momentum by the subfilter velocity. Let me circle, say in blue, the terms that are unclosed, the terms that will require explicitly, explicitly that we take an action. Well, unfortunately for us, well, that's not a circle, but unfortunately for us, this is unclosed. It is not readily computable for us what the filtered stress sensor is. We could compute the stress sensor from the filtered velocity and pressure, but they are not the same thing. So we'll need some approximation here. This, this is unclosed. I don't know what the evaporation is. I can provide a model for it, but you know, if I need a model, it's uh, precisely because it's unclosed. This, it is unclosed. I don't know a priori what the interface uh, rate of exchange of momentum is. So I need to provide a model for it. And finally, this is also an unclosed term. Uh, instead of going into details uh, below, I'm just going to give you uh, essentially a bullet list of uh, what we do for closing. So at this point, we're done with the framework. The framework is there as far as the fluid phase is concerned. Um, so we need to invoke some sort of modeling assumptions. And so I'll just put one statement for each. Right here, we're going to say that effectively the particles we expect will enhance in some way the um, the um, the fluid stresses. We don't really know how to account for that. Uh, we've, boiled in, we've boiled this down in essentially a term that is a, uh, like an effective viscosity. We don't think it's good. Uh, we don't know what to do here. It would require quite a bit of analysis to go beyond. Uh, so essentially, we don't know what to do. What we do is we look at uh, effective viscosity models for multi-phase mixtures out there. And we look at whether they're important or not. And every time that they're important, we decide that we don't know really how to simulate the problem. So essentially, we try to be careful that this term doesn't influence the calculation too much. So it's not a particularly, uh, essentially, this is work in progress at this point. What I will say is that uh, we rely on effective Viscosity model, uh, the first, uh, probably most well known, is, uh, came from uh, Einstein, but we typically use an expression that is uh, essentially a mu star uh, for the fluid that is, um, where am I here? that is equal to a function of the particle volume fraction and the filtered fluid viscosity. That's, uh, and the person, uh, the, the model we use is due, uh, it was proposed by G. Bilaro. But essentially, we check that it doesn't have much of an influence because we don't really know what to do there. Uh, the convective term, well, this looks a lot like uh, what you would see in turbulence and uh, larger dissimulation. So we've uh, classically invoked a, um, a similar uh, subscale model in the form of essentially a turbulent viscosity model. 
Uh, and then we use what's called the dynamic closure for it. So we use essentially the state-of-the-art type of approaches that are used for larger dissimulation. You can do whatever you want, but uh, again, the uh, turbulent viscosity type approach makes sense. Why do we do that? Well, because in the limit where we wouldn't have any particles, we know that those models work well. So in the limit of no particles, we're doing larger dissimulation, really. So we use an LES model, typically uh, turbulent viscosity. with some sort of a dynamics Magorinsky, if that makes sense uh, to you, great. Um, if not, it's just a little bit uh, out, of, uh, out of topic. And I can give you a reference here, which uh, um, um, well, I'll, I'll we can talk about that more this afternoon. Um, the interface coupling term warrants a little bit of uh, discussion. So at this point, this is our F interface for particle P. We said this is the volume of the particle times the filtered fluid stress evaluated at the particle position, uh, sorry, the divergence of that. So this is closed. If we are happy with our uh, tau bar, we can just evaluate it and we're done. Plus the integral over the surface of the fluctuating fluid stress at the surface dotted with n dy. So we can reasonably claim that this is closed this is, however, unclosed, and that requires action. So what is this? So this is where things uh, become surprisingly simple. This is the force felt by the particle due to the fluid. T prime is the difference between the true fluid stress and the filtered uh, fluid stress. The filter is essentially on the scale of a few times the particle. So I would expect the filtered fluid stress to essentially lose the information of the boundary layers at the surface of the particle, the phenomenon acting on the scale smaller than the filter. So I would expect specifically T prime then to be the stresses that emerge due to the presence of the particle in the fluid. Okay? When I filtered my field, I do not see my particle anymore. So this guy is essentially unaware of the presence of the particle. This one is the difference between the full field and the unaware field. So this is just the amount of awareness of my fluid of the presence of, particle, of the particle. So what we're saying here is that the particle feels at a for, as a force, the integral over its surface of the, st the stresses induced by the very fact that it's present in the flow. Well, this is drag. The fact that when I introduce a particle in the flow, I change the flow, and in response, the flow induces a stress on the particle, that is essentially drag. This is, in the end, surprisingly simple. Conceptually, this is a very simple idea. So maybe the simplest way to think about this is imagine a single particle, uniform flow. Okay? If you didn't have the particle, there would be no fluid stress. You put the particle, you have fluid stresses. If you assume your filter is acting on a large enough scale, once you filtered tau, you've zeroed it out, essentially. Okay? So therefore, the fluctuating stress is entirely the stress due to the particle. So this is here modeled as particle drag. Uh, 
I'm not just saying that. So we we we, uh, we uh, postulated that a few years ago. Uh, we went back a year afterwards and tested this idea by actually running simulations of fully resolved particles and then filtering explicitly and looking at whether this term was exactly drag or not. And we found that provided the filter is not too small, it is pretty much exactly drag. Yes? Uh, it's like some filter fluctuations. Right? So when we're calculating particle drag, we should calculate the fluctuating velocities at those levels. Well, so remember that we're filtering on a scale that's essentially the, the smallest scale that's larger, that's sufficiently larger than the particle. So we don't have, we're not talking here about, you know, filtering length scale like this with a point particle in the middle. Uh, we're talking about a filtering length scale that's just one engineering order of magnitude larger than the particle. Yes, so we're, that's the next thing we're going to talk about. So here, I'll just say it's modeled as particle drag. Uh, so this is equal to F drag, and that's it. And so here, we're going to use drag laws, or drag correlations. OK. That concludes the list of all the unclosed terms in the fluid side and what we're doing for them. Now, we've talked about the Eulean side of this Lagrange model. Hopefully, you know, uh, the good news for us is we've talked already extensively about the um, Lagrangian side as well, so we don't need to spend much time. The Lagrangian side basically was saying that for all particles, we solved those equations, okay, which we listed before already. Now we've explicitly said that F inter for particle P is going to be the volume of particle P times the divergence of my filtered stress tensor at that location plus MP times some sort of a Schiller Neumann drag coefficient over tau P times UF minus UP, something like that. And the question is, well, what is it specifically? Well, on the next page, I'm, I'm saying explicitly what that is. Um, once we've done that, I'd like to point out that now all of our equations are closed. So we're done with that exercise. Um, I've pointed this out already, so I'll just mention it briefly again. If I have a mean pressure gradient, so if P bar in my fluid has a constant gradient, say a hydrostatic distribution, well, boom, that's, buoyant, that's buoyancy, okay? It readily uh, uh, comes, you don't need to reintroduce it in any way, it, we never gave it up. Um, if the volume fraction is small enough, if epsilon p is small enough, we're essentially done. Because the one thing we haven't specified at this point is the collision term, but if the volume fraction is small enough, we don't need to worry about it. If the volume fraction is not small enough, then we still have to work a little bit on the collision term. In addition to that, we also need to work a bit on how we would estimate properly the fluid around the particle on the appropriate scale, given the presence of all the other particles around and all this. And that will require also a bit more work. So I'm run, already running out of time, so well, I'll... Um, let me think. So I was talking about drag laws for dense regimes. Uh, Let me just do one more thing. So this was, uh, this, this was um, the point of the next two pages was to highlight that from fully resolved simulations, it is possible to explicitly measure what the drag should be on any type of systems of, uh, of particles at high concentrations or viable concentration with different arrangements. So you can push a flow past an array of particles, measure the drag, and see how it differs uh, 
from uh, Stokes drag. Okay, so a lot of people have done that, uh, and I wanted to illustrate some of this work. And essentially, what you see is that there's two competing effects. Drag decreases because the particles sit in the wake of the particle in front of them, but also drag increases because the more particles you have, the faster the flow has to go through an ensemble of particles because of the volumetric obstruction caused by the particles. Okay? If I put many particles and I want to flow at the same rate, the fluid effectively has to navigate into little channels, it ends up going faster. So there's two competing effects that you can normalize in different ways, so I was talking a bit about that. Overall, you end up naturally writing things out in the following way. If I want to express my, express my drag for my particle P, oh, sorry, I guess particle, wait, I went from P to I, so that should be P here, not I. I don't know why. So if I want to write my drag for particle P divided by the mass for particle P, so basically the acceleration, typically you would write it, so this is now purely a modeling statement uh, where we've moved, moved pretty far away from uh, proper uh, mathematics at this point, we're just uh, trying to mimic the physics. This is typically what you would write. You would still write a velocity difference divided by a characteristic time scale, and you would see a couple of differences. One would be a product of the uh, fluid volume fraction, and then you would see that your uh, correlation coefficient would not, no longer just be a function of the Reynolds number, it would also be a function of the fluid volume fraction. So you're basically saying, well, Stokes drag is a reasonable starting point, but let me fix it by accounting for the fact that it is not appropriate, uh, appropriate is the, if the round summer increases, but it's also not appropriate if I have many particles. There's a whole lot of correlations. This is uh, probably the two most well known, but uh, there's probably a hundred out there. Ergun's correlation from uh, over half a century ago has been used quite a bit, and that provides that expression for this f. So you can see that this is a correlation of the function of Reynolds number and epsilon. Highly nonlinear. More recently, but not that much, uh, when in use, correlation takes Schiele Neumann, exactly the way we, we, uh, we talked about it a, uh, a few days ago, and it provides just a, uh, a correction with an epsilon f term. What I've classically used uh, in a good number of, uh, of my recent simulations has been pretty recent work by Tinetti and Subramaniam, again, still the same Subramaniam from uh, Iowa State University, and they have this expression. So this is Schiller Neumann, corrected with an epsilon f, and then there's two additional corrections. One is a pure epsilon f correction, and another one is a little bit more uh, subtle and contains more things. So it's a bit more detailed correlation. What they did is, so, so they have a big um, immersed boundary code and they pushed flows at different velocities around different configurations of particles at different volume fractions. They extracted the drag and they plotted all this and then they built those correlations. Okay, so we're essentially taking micro scale information that was correlated and re-injecting it in what we've been calling mesoscale simulations. Simulations where the interface coupling is modeled, everything else is, is, uh, is, uh, is directly contained. One last point I want to make on this, and then the last thing will be uh, collisions, but we'll talk about that this afternoon. We change the definition of that Reynolds number when we have high volume fraction particles. And that's the first half to the answer of, of your question. There's a second half that I was not planning to talk about, but we can talk about that one on one if you want. Um, the, um, typically, you would write REP as the fluid density times the particle velocity minus the fluid velocity, so the slip velocity, uh, the magnitude of this, uh, times the particle diameter divided by the fluid viscosity. Okay? Well, the local fluid velocity is not really the relevant piece of information because it's going to be in, uh, artificially increased by the fact that you have many particles. So if my epsilon f, if my fluid um, 
volume fraction is not one, that means that just due to conservation of mass, the fluid that's flowing in between my particles is actually going artificially faster than the far field free stream. And so we try to correct for that in order, in fact, to reconnect with the Schiller Neumann correlation by simply saying, well, you know, simply from conservation of mass, we should be careful about the concept of superficial velocity. Basically saying that if I restrict the area through which my fluid can pass, then I artificially increase its uh, velocity. And so the way you do this is by simply multiplying by the available uh, uh, volume through which you can flow. So that's just a factor, by the, uh, a factor of the volume fraction. So let me say one word here about the concept of superficial velocity. This is the velocity that, fluid would, that the fluid would have without the particles. It doesn't matter if you have a volume fraction of 10 to minus 3. If you have a volume fraction of 10 to minus 2 or 10 to minus 1, it does matter quite a bit more. If you are at the close pack system, you're looking at a filter, it matters enormously. And again, this is from 1D mass conservation, so it's just a factor of epsilon f. So being cognizant, cognizant of that, we redefine in that situation the Reynolds number for particle p as being epsilon f times rho f times the slip velocity times dp over the viscosity, okay? So I just artificially reduce the Reynolds number to not double, double count the effect of the particle. Yes, the fluid has been accelerated, but if I were to be far enough from the particle, it would, it would not be accelerated due to the presence of the particle. What we're left with is the discussion of uh, collisions. So we'll do that this afternoon, and then we'll talk about the implementation of that. And then we'll, uh, oops, sorry, yes. And then we'll, um, um, so we'll, we'll play with that. We'll discuss about uh, various aspects of this. Um, the main thing we'll focus on again this afternoon is collisions. We will not, like I said, implement the volume fraction uh, terms. It wouldn't be complicated, it would require uh, some additional numerical subtleties, but not a lot, but it would increase the size of the code quite a bit sufficiently that it would make things quite a bit unwieldy. So we'll stop after having put collisions. Um, and then the last thing we'll do, uh, I guess, tomorrow morning is uh, I'll talk to you about some recent research application of those type of methods. I'll show you how we've used this to look at dilute turbulent two-phase flows how we've looked at uh, dense turbulent two-phase flows, transitional turbulent two-phase flows, uh, and we'll look at how this can predict some interesting physics regarding clustering. Okay, thank you for your attention. Uh, let me know, by the way, if you have any questions, and if not, I'll see you at, uh, at 2 this afternoon.